change the direction because it was something just so soft and light in comparison to your proper heavy mm. tracks. Yeah, it's a very good question. I, I never actually thought of, it, thought of it that way. I think Phil was one of these songwriters that um, had a, a, an amazing ability to mix up the songs. He wasn't just a one, a one track guy. He, you know, he knew that he, he could he could interpret slow songs, medium tempo songs, sad songs, happy songs. He was an incredible uh, songwriter in that respect. And he and he, he wouldn't just rest on his laurels. He knew he could write good rock songs, but he just he didn't rest on his laurels. He went he brought he branched out a bit. He could do ballads. You could do bluesy kind of ballads, slow tunes, and that's where that, that was the bracket Sarah came into. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a complete change of, of tact from his, the previous uh, singles we, we released. You know, and I, I, I kind of knew when I heard it that you know this this could be a big hit, and, and I, I, at that stage nobody knew it was going to be released as a single because it was going to go on his album, his solo album. So when somebody mentioned it to me that yeah, the record company want to release this as a single, I knew then it was going to be a hit. I just had this uh, intuition that it was going to be a, a hit, and I was, it was, it was proven right. Yeah. And it's just an amazing song. Gary Moore's solo is lovely on it. It was recorded in, in Barbados, and um, I was just it was just a, a beautiful tribute to to his daughter. And what happened after that? Then um, you had this again massive success, beautiful, beautiful track. How how did that impact you sort of on as, a, as a band? Um, well, I mean, at that stage um, we were kind of going into slight doldrums because Gary Moore had left mm -hmm. not too long after that. But he left he left us in the lurch to say the least because we were in the middle of an American tour, and Gary decided to take off. You know, uh, we, we were playing a, a tour with a, a Journey. Okay. You know, and um, we, in fact, we had to finish that tour and then go on to another tour. I think the other tour was with Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Now it could be wrong there, but I remember near the end of the Journey tour, uh, Gary just took off. He, he left the band and he didn't didn't tell anybody. So he left the band and flew to fr from uh, I think it was Miami. Where, where we played the previous night, he flew on his own to New York and stayed with uh, Glenn Hughes from Deep Purple and told nobody where he was. So we, we were concerned where he was, but we were also concerned because we had to play the next night. We had to obviously cancel that gig and phone, phone back. But who, who did we get to, to replace him? And Phil said, well, Midge, you're as available. So Midge was contacted and Midge uh, eventually said, yeah, no problem, I'll, I'll come out. He had a, 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 the old Walkmans with all the tracks that Phil had told him to learn. He was, and unfortunately, he was sent over by Concord, so he didn't have much time to listen to, to these songs on his Walkman, right? because Concord was so quick. I got there in a few hours, you know. So by the time he landed, he said he'd only a handful of songs uh, learned on the flight, you know, so it was that quick, he had to learn them on the flight. Um, by the time he got to the... Uh, to the gig, you know, he was basically straight on stage playing songs he, he, he didn't really know, and, he, and he, he did a great job. You know, he jammed a, lo a little bit along, he yeah. stopped playing when he didn't know the chords. Scott, Scott obviously took his pieces, you know, played mm -hmm. his parts. But after a couple of days, he, he, yeah, he, got the, he got the idea, he knew what to do, you know. He had a little bit more rehearsal with Scott in the dressing rooms and mm -hmm. the hotel rooms. And, came together okay, but lucky enough he was available because we'd, we'd have to cancel the tour. And what was the reaction then of um, fans who had obviously come to see Gary as well? Well, they were, they were a bit disappointed to <laughs> say the least. You know, they were disappointed, but what can you do? You have to continue the, the tour with no option. And, uh, you know, he was kind enough to come out and just play with us, you know, and jam with us, and that's what it was. But, uh, as I say, we, we got it together after a few days and, you know, the rest of the the whole the, the rest of the tour was fine, you know. We had really no problems with it. But we had to go back to England and find somebody else. I mean, Mitch, yeah. Mitch didn't, he, he was he was playing with uh, Ultra Box, you know. So he couldn't he couldn't join permanently. So we had to do start more auditions. And 
in fact, lucky enough, Scott knew Snowy White, who was at that stage playing uh, Pink Floyd. And Scott said, look, you know, forget, forget your auditions, I'll just give Snowy a, a call. And I said, yeah, that's, that's a good idea, give him a call. And so the Phil, he, get, he called him up. And Snowy said, yeah, I'll come down, have a, have a rehearsal and see how it goes. And he came down literally the next day. A couple of days after we got back off the tour, we went into rehearsals. And uh, I know a lot of people think maybe, you know, Snowy wasn't the obvious obvious choice uh, he shouldn't have been in the band because you know his image was completely at odds with the rest of the band's image you know but he played great when he came down fantastic i had no problem with him phil had no problem the problems came later when the, the fans seen the band on stage and weren't really impressed with snowy i, I have no idea why but you know a couple of years later you, you kind of hear people saying well you know, he just didn't fit in, you know, but I didn't think so at the time. I thought he fitted in perfectly, but obviously the fans didn't think that. So was it, was it the fish or was it his musical ability or his, um, you know, like the way he played? What was it? I just think? think it was, I just think it was a bit of a clash of personalities rather than anything else. Between him he, and the fans or? I think more, more be between him and Phil. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. he was, he was a, he, lay, he was very laid back, you know. He, he wasn't really uh, a rocker, you know. He, he knew he, um, his limitations. He was more into blues. He was playing Pink Floyd. He was, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a second guitar player in Pink Floyd. But he played great. The, the night we went to see Pink, Pink Floyd, Snowy White was all over the stage, you know, he was playing great. But when he joined us, I think people were just a little bit surprised that he wasn't as flamboyant maybe as Gary Moore or Eric Bell or Robbo. You know, he just wasn't, just didn't have the, the stage presence maybe that, that the previous guitar players had. So you mentioned there may be a possible clash of personalities with him, with himself and with Phil. Yeah. So how did that impact then on the on the rest on the band? Oh no, then? it did. It did impact. Yeah. Big time. It did. You know, the, the tension was there. But uh, you know, he, he he did two amazing albums with us. He did Renegade and he did Chinatown. You know, so even though there's a bit of a clash of personalities when it came into the studio situation, environment. There's no problems whatsoever. I didn't say any problems. Phil accepted the whole situation. You know, everybody can't be, get on with everybody all the time. You know, we, we accepted that. Phil accepted it and um, mm -hmm. there's no problem. The problems are kind of apparent when you see Snowy doing an interview and he'd say, yeah, well, I, well, I, was getting, I came down for breakfast one, one day, which this is true. He came down to the hotel and Phil was coming towards him in, in the hotel and he said to Phil, he said, oh, did you, did you just come from breakfast? Was well, breakfast nice? And Phil said, no, I am coming. came from a nightclub. <laughs> I've been in a nightclub all night. And so he, and this is like nine o'clock in the morning. So I said, okay, you know. But when it happened the second night, so he said, and he kind of got concerned. He only joined the band and Phil was kind of staying out half the night and on, on, the, on, the, on the razzle, you know. Yeah. He said it became obvious after a few weeks that this, this wasn't going to work, you know. Phil coming in and getting on stage half groggy and making, you know, not mistakes, but making things a little bit more difficult than they should be because mm -hmm. he, he wasn't completely on it. I think that kind of upset Snowy in some ways. Okay. Did, it, did it escalate then for Phil? Well, know, well the band it. then realised, yeah, you know, so Snowy decided just to leave, you know. The, the clash became so, so obvious, mm -hmm. you know, the discontent. And uh, after two albums, he decided that was it. He went back to uh, play parenting with Pink Floyd. You know, I don't blame him for doing that. I, I would have done the same <laughs> if it was Pink Floyd. You know. So, so, so what happened then? You know, like obviously with all of these constant changes as well, it must have been very difficult for you as a band. No, it wasn't difficult. We just carried on. Like, we, we did previously. We had um, a, a, a producer called Chris Dangaridis. He suggested that we get uh, John Sykes to come down and play with us. Yeah, yeah. So John was in Tigers of Pantang. He was playing with him, and he was do, he was doing a session with, with uh, Chris. And during the session, Chris just mentioned it to him that we were looking for a guitar player, and John said, "I'll be there tomorrow." You know, okay. he loved he loved him as he came down. And uh, came out of the studio, it was, it was Pete, uh, the Who's studio, Pete Townsend. 
uh, Ramport, and he came in and, uh, oh, it wasn't Ramport, sorry, it was a different studio. I can't remember the name of it now. He came down anyway, and uh, from the first, literally, first couple of notes, I knew John uh, was the guy. You know, he came in. I, I was a bit heavier, a bit of a heavier kind of a, a sound, you know, that he had, much heavier than maybe Gary and much heavier than Robbo and Scott. But that was the that was the guitar player we picked because we were trying to find a new kind of a direction, you know. Mm -hmm. And John had a he heavy metal sound, which was nice, you know. And that's that's the direction we decided to take. Okay. Slightly more heavy metal than the previous stuff. Yeah. So. I think we should leave it at that because after that, right. really, it gets bogged down and feels bad health, and I don't really want That's to just that. You know. Okay. So we, we leave it at that. Do you want me um, just to, to mention Philomena? Yeah, yeah. And just, yeah. Yeah, and just a, a quick thing just about Philomena. Yeah, know? of course. Are we? Uh, 